I'd like to talk a little bit about the Mughal Empire, the dominant force in the Indian subcontinent in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. The Mughal Empire is one of the so-called gunpowder empires, and they're called gunpowder empires because they were built by armies that were among the first to effectively rely on gunpowder in war. Uh, this empire is also what was called a Turco-Mongol empire uh, due to the fact that its founders, the Timurid dynasty, uh, consisted of a kind of hybrid ethnicity of Turkish and Mongol origins. The Mughal Empire, prior to the British Empire, uh, was instrumental in shaping the modern nation of India in that it was one of the first polities to actually bring the vast majority of the subcontinent under its rule. To understand the Mughal Empire, we first have to understand this concept of Turco-Mongols. Uh, if we remember, the Mongol Empire was the largest contiguous land empire in the history of the world. The Mongols under Genghis Khan and later Kublai Khan conquered vast swaths of the earth of the Eurasian uh, supercontinent. And during that time, the Mongols, the various Mongol warlords, uh, after the, the empire split into multiple empires, uh, the various warlords mixed with different nomadic tribesmen who lived similar lifestyles. The different Turkish tribes and the different Mongol tribes would mix in, particularly in areas in Central Asia, where, which were not native to either. Um, <clears throat> like we might uh, uh, call the, uh, modern Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, etc. Uh, and they formed what we call Turco-Mongol confederations. Uh, alliances, marital alliances of Turks and Mongols who came together to form kind of fighting bands. These bands of warriors were extraordinarily ferocious on the battlefield because, like the Mongols before them, they were powerful horsemen, they were great cavalry commanders, and they had the incredible speed and power of horse archery, horse archery of their predecessors. But on top of that, they were among the first to master gunpowder. Uh, the Mongols actually experienced gunpowder during the first instance of its, uh, of its use in warfare when the Chinese used it against them, uh, and they began to spread that technology westward uh, throughout uh, along the Silk Road as their armies moved to conquer different regions. And the Turco-Mongols saw gunpowder as a means of overcoming their primary weakness, which was their infantry forces. They were excellent horsemen, but when it came to fighting on foot, they were at uh, a disadvantage. And that, of course, meant that they were disadvantaged in particular terrain, mountainous terrain, heavily forested terrain, and also at sea. Uh, and so these Turco-Mongol leaders began to adapt to this condition. Uh, the, the, the situations like, for example, where the Kublai Khan was defeated in Japan uh, and in Vietnam, because in, with Japan they had a naval disadvantage, and in Vietnam they had the disadvantage of the thick forest. Uh, Gunpowder was a means for them to overcome uh, their weakness. And, of course, they used it to great effect, along with their powerful horsemen, to create large empires. Again, this is why we refer to these Turco-Mongol empires as gunpowder empires. To understand the Mughals, we have to look at their origins, which lie with Tamerlane, also known as Timur the Lame. Uh, Timur was a great Turco-Mongol conqueror of both of mixed Mongol and Turkish descent, and he was a descendant of Genghis Khan. And he created a huge empire out of what was called the Jagatai Khanate, which was part of what's now Turkmenistan. Uh, Jagatai was one of the sons of Genghis Khan, uh, and we call it the Jagatai Khanate because the leaders were descendants of, of Jagatai. Uh, in that part of the Mongol Empire. But Timur the Lame resurrected that empire after its fall and began to invade his neighbors. Particularly, he conquered Persia, what's now the country of Iran. He fielded extraordinarily powerful armies 
uh, with very powerful horsemen and also early uh, effective use of gunpowder units. And he conquered, in addition to what's now Iran, also what's now Iraq, uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and much of Kazakhstan, along with what we uh, now call Afghanistan. Uh, Tamerlane was extraordinarily brutal. Uh, he came into contact with the Knights Hospitaller, a crusading order that had taken the island of Smyrna off the coast of what's now Turkey. Uh, and uh, again, <clears throat> in order to overcome the disadvantage, the natural disadvantage that these Central Asian warriors had at sea, they began to invest in gunpowder warfare, and they were able to use cannons from ships to destroy the Crusaders' fortress at Smyrna. Uh, the Knights Hospitaller died almost to a man, and the inhabitants of the island were massacred. Again, like his predecessor, Genghis Khan, uh, Timur, or Tamerlane, uh, used brutality also as a weapon uh, to spread fear and as a psychological tool. Of course, once he began to administer his empire, uh, he began to administer it peacefully, which is one reason that his descendants would maintain power. Timur wanted to restore the Mongol Empire, not just in Persia and in Central Asia. He wanted to reconquer China, which was now under the Ming Dynasty, a native, uh, a native dynasty that was the result of the Hongwu Emperor rising up and throwing the Mongols out. Well, Tamerlane, Timur the Lame, wanted to reconquer this. Uh, he actually marched on the western border of the Ming Empire, but he died as a result of vomiting uh, in a drunken stupor and actually choking on his own vomit. This was actually a relatively common way for Mongol warriors to die due to the fact that these, these Turco-Mongols, uh, despite the fact that they were Muslim and alcohol was prohibited, uh, they came from this very rough warrior culture in Central Asia, in the Mongolian and Central Asian steppe, and drinking was part a, a, a vital part of manhood. Uh, and so these rulers would struggle to avoid drinking, and then they would end up binge drinking, and in many instances they would end up dying. Uh, so uh, what we would now call alcoholism was a huge part of that culture. And of course, once... Uh, the, these rulers embraced Islam, it became a point of contention. Uh, and there's actually a great deal of poetry about this uh, by one of uh, Timur's descendants. And that descendant is Babur. And Babur was an extraordinary individual. He was a descendant of Timur through his father, and thus a descendant of Genghis Khan through his father. But he was also a descendant of Genghis Khan through his mother as well. So he was doubly a descendant of Genghis Khan. Uh, he inherited his father's power in what's now Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, and he began to build up his band of warriors. And he fought against other Turco-Mongol clans for supremacy, particularly over the city of Samarkand, which was Tamerlane's capital, uh, a city uh, that at the time was a great wonder of the world uh, in what's now Uzbekistan. And he was defeated, ultimately. Uh, he captured and lost Samarkand three times. Despite losing in Central Asia, Babur didn't give up his dream of having a vast empire. So he set his sights on India. He invaded India, and the Rajputs of India were in a... Uh, the, the, and the Lodi Sultan were in kind of a period of corruption and decline. And he eventually won the Battle of Panipat, and defeated the Lodi Sultan and established his own empire in northern India. And it was from his empire that the Mughal Empire began to expand. Now, the word Mughal is actually Persian for Mongol. So, technically, it's the Mongol Empire. We call it the Mughal Empire, again, because uh, they're not, uh, these are not, we distinguish this set of Mongols from the original set. Uh, these are actually Turco-Mongols. Despite the uh, great deal of violence that occurred with Babur's conquest, as a ruler, he was relatively benign. Uh, 
he began to make alliances with local families, and he tolerated much of the local Hindu culture. Uh, he actually wrote down his memoirs uh, that are called the Babur Nama, uh, and they're, uh, in which he described many, many, many different topics. He was a great poet as well, and of course this is something that uh, was unique and, and would be unique about the Mughals, given that many of these Turco-Mongol warlords were not literate. They did not value literacy because it was not part of their nomadic lifestyle. Babur's son was uh, less successful as a ruler in that he very nearly lost his empire due to rebellion. But Babur's grandson, Akbar, also called Akbar the Great, is considered generally to have been the greatest of the Mughal emperors. Uh, he expanded his territory further throughout India after crushing the rebellion. Uh, and in addition to being a great conqueror, he was also a great thinker. Like his father, he was highly literate, very well educated, and very intelligent. Uh, and like his father, he was also a poet, but he went beyond his father in that he was uh, a philosopher as well. And one thing that the Mughals struggled with throughout their reign is something that the contemporary Indian government struggles with. Uh, and that is the great diversity of cultures, of languages, of religions uh, throughout the Indian subcontinent. Well, Akbar attempted to unify all of the disparate cultures within his empire in kind of a single creed. Akbar, like Babur, was highly tolerant of uh, the Hindus, Jains, and other religious groups, Buddhists, who lived within his empire, despite the fact that he himself uh, held a formerly Islamic government. One thing that Akbar did is that he changed the law so that no one religion held precedence over another. In fact, he attempted to create a creed that unified all of these different religions, their basic premises, under what he called the oneness of God. So he promoted those philosophers and teachers and officials uh, who espoused unity despite there being differences in religious opinion. The principles of this pantheistic creed uh, were the oneness of God, which was taken from Islam, the idea that uh, it, it was adapted. Uh, in Islam, you have uh, kind of perfect monotheism. God is one being. Uh, Akbar argued that all of the different Hindu deities were actually manifestations of that one being which is similar to uh, the Hindu concept. Uh, he, also are, he also believed in abstaining from meat, which was a Hindu belief that went, into, uh, that went into the creed. And he believed in ahimsa, or this principle of nonviolence, which was also part of the Hindu and Jain religions. Uh, he promoted celibacy, though he didn't require it. Uh, this due to the fact that... Uh, uh, he encountered some Christian priests who were practicing celibacy, and he was so impressed by the idea that he encouraged it amongst his uh, devotees. And he wanted all of these different principles to be a unifying factor, uh, a unifying influence under his reign, because he was having trouble governing the many diverse peoples of India. Uh, one thing that he also pushed is he pushed an official culture based on the Urdu language, which was a Persian language, kind of a literary language of the time. Uh, and uh, he centralized authority under him, and he created a system in which you would be promoted in official service regardless of which religion you followed. So if you were a Hindu, you could still rise uh, high in the ranks of his government uh, if you were a Christian, etc. Uh, so he created this system of religious tolerance that really strengthened the Mughal state. On top of this, he was a great scholar and created one of the world's largest libraries uh, with over 24,000 books included. Akbar was succeeded by his son, Shah Jahan, who continued his policy of attempting to unify the various peoples of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, one emphasis of his was architecture, and he emphasized uh, encourage fusing Islamic 
styles with minarets and large uh, uh, and predominantly uh, marble architecture with Hindu styles with the kind of flowing inscriptions that are typical of Hindu temples. And his great contribution was the construction of the Taj Mahal. If you've heard of the Taj Mahal, the original Taj Mahal, there's a casino as well. Uh, Taj is the nickname of Mumtaz Mahal. Uh, Mumtaz Mahal, her birth name was Arjamund. Uh, Mumtaz Mahal is actually her title. She was the consort empress of Shah Jahan. And Shah, De Shah Jahan was devoted to her. Uh, it's one of history's greatest love stories. Um, when they were betrothed, he was 15, she was 14. She ended up bearing Shah Jahan 14 children, seven of which died very young. And uh, Shah Jahan was devoted to his wife. Uh, she would follow him on military campaigns during the earlier part of his reign. He was a great warrior. She would travel with the army. Uh, she would help him make different decisions. Uh, she served as kind of a very close confidant. And uh, he gave her the title of Mumtaz Mahal, which means greatest in all the palaces of the world. She passed away while giving birth to their 14th child. And her death absolutely devastated Shah Jahan. Uh, she was 38 when she passed away. And he went into a long, a year-long period of mourning, after which his hair had completely turned white. And it was only through the efforts of their daughter that he was even able to, to recover enough to continue to rule. The method of grieving that uh, Shah Jahan used was to construct for his late wife one of the world's greatest tombs, the Taj Mahal, the beautiful structure you see there made out of white marble with a massive garden surrounding it. The garden contains the four rivers of paradise that exist in the Islamic uh, concept of heaven. And the idea was that and, and the interior were filled with verses from the, with Surah from the Quran uh, uh, describing the afterlife, describing the final judgment, uh, etc. And the whole idea was that uh, he would see Mumtaz Mahal again after his death. And both he and Mumtaz Mahal's bodies were eventually buried inside the Taj Mahal. And the Taj Mahal is one of the world's greatest structures, one of the wonders of the world, uh, stemming from their relationship. The last Mughal emperor we'll talk about today is Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb was the son of Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal, uh, and he ended up actually imprisoning his father, uh, claiming that his father had been driven mad by Mumtaz Mahal's death over the years, uh, and actually, after imprisoning him, uh, ruled while his father was still alive. Aurangzeb was very, very warlike. Uh, he conquered much of the southern portion of the Indian subcontinent. And while, on the one hand, he was very successful militarily, he politically laid the foundation for the Mughal Empire's demise, weakness and demise. Unlike Shah Jahan, and Akbar, uh, even going all the way back to Babur, uh, Aurangzeb was not tolerant of many of his subjects' religious beliefs. He was very committed to Islamic law, to imposing an Islamic, a thoroughly Islamic state throughout northern India. And of course, the majority of his subjects were Hindus. So when he began to destroy Hindu temples and to forbid Hindu religious practices on the, on the grounds that uh, these Hindu practices were idolatry, that they were, they were the worship of multiple gods, worship of statues, etc. When he began to destroy these statues of Krishna, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, etc., um, the people ro revolted against him. And he ended up having to quell rebellions for almost the, the entire second half of his reign. After his death, bit by bit, pieces of India began to revolt against the Mughal Empire 
and ruler after ruler, more and more territory was lost. Eventually, the Mughal Empire was reduced to kind of a rump state in northern India when it was fully annexed by the British Empire in 1857. And this climate of cultural, religious, and ethnic tension is something that plagues India even today. For example, uh, one of the historically, the, in the modern era, uh, the, the most bitter rivalries, that of India and Pakistan, uh, is largely, it, it concerns the reign of Aurangzeb. In Pakistan, Aurangzeb is seen as a hero, uh, somebody who ended the oppressive caste system, ended the oppression of the Dalits, and, and, and did so through the imposition of Islamic law. Uh, in much of India, for many Hindus, Aurangzeb is seen as an oppressor, someone who uh, destroyed their temples and oppressed the traditional Indian Hindu uh, religious traditions. And the reign of Aurangzeb uh, led to such tension that even his father's creation, the Taj Mahal, is not without controversy in contemporary India, in which some Hindu nationalists argue that the Taj Mahal is not a representative of uh, of Indian architecture and Indian culture, but actually a symbol of foreign domination. And of course, for those uh, Muslim Indians, the Taj Mahal has a completely different appeal. Uh, so, uh, for example, in the contemporary Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, uh, a brochure was released in 2017 uh, that didn't even include the Taj Mahal as a tourist attraction. And it was inspired by this view of the Taj Mahal as a foreign, a sign of foreign invasion. And of course, that uh, controversy over uh, whether to change that or not was a, was a huge political row in that state of India. So we can characterize the Mughal Empire, like British India after it, like contemporary independent India of today, uh, as being dominated by uh, what to do about uh, the cultural, uh, ethnic, and religious pluralism that dominates the subcontinent. Uh, there are some rulers, like Akbar, who attempted to, and Shah Jahan, and Babur, who attempted to deal with it uh, through toleration, and then there are those like Aurangzeb, who attempted to impose a kind of unity. And we'll stop there. <laughs>